POI Investment Assistance Services, Department of Trade and Industry, Philippines, Mr. Aihan Zetino Lu, Vice President Tobe, Mr. Brian O. Gallagher, Deputy CEO, Australia Chamber of Commerce, Northern Territory. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the session on Discovery Business Opportunities through CASI, the Asia Pacific home to the world's largest and fastest developing economy, spearheading growth in trade, investment, new technologies, innovation, reforms have combined population of 3 billion. 40% of the world population, a combined GDP of 15 trillion, and a combined trade of estimated 8 trillion. Recent economic trends in Asia and Asia led optimism to perception that region will maintain its preponderant influence on the engine of the global economy in future also. In this regard, I would like to request Mr. Arden Delvich, Vice President Moscow CCI, to make his remark on this issue. You can speak here. You can speak here. Thank you. Can you launch the presentation, please? Um, thank you very much, Cassie, for invitation. Thank you, dear participants, uh, for your attention. Uh, greetings from uh, Moscow, from, from uh, Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and from uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Russian Federation. Um, slides, please. Uh, I think this this conference is really great. Hmm? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Or presentation to kindly dakhachan na kano. You want to show it now? Arden. Yeah. You want to show it now? Yeah, I'll continue. Okay. Presentation. Did you hear? Bolle kindly dakhen. Oh. Presentation is slight to Kothai. And can I ask you for a clicker, please? Clicker Kothai. Slide clicker to Kothai. Adnan, Adnan, one no presentation. Yeah, now, thake, ta, ready to Please, Mr. Adnan. Discover, Kess. Discover. Dis yeah, thank you. Uh, launch. Full screen, please. Yeah. Yes, once again, thank you very much for waiting uh, for the presentation. Uh, now, um, now I'm happy to talk about uh, business opportunities. Uh, business opportunities through CASI, and um, what uh, what do we see? Uh, what do we know about CASI? Uh, it unites chambers from 27 countries and cuts across national boundaries to link businessmen. Uh, more than that, CASI is an effective wi window to the whole global ecosystem of chambers, which uh, unites more than 45 million businesses around the world. These businesses are chamber members. Uh, they can be very useful to each other. They sell something and buy something every day. So um, they, uh, all businesses united by chambers are a great platform and great ecosystem. And uh, together we can say that chambers are global, very powerful global business platform. Uh, and there was an idea. Uh, if chamber members all over the world can be so useful to each other, then this global business-to-business -business market should be operated by chambers of commerce and industry to give their members special services and platform to interact with each other. And now we have this platform. Uh, now we had business market. This is chamber-based international uh, business-to-business -business platform, which is already operated by chambers. 
This is an online platform uh, which is um, based on chambers. It, is, it was created by chambers and for chamber members. Basing on international system of chambers, it helps businesses to work without borders uh, all over the world. In, and uh, the basic element in this platform is business proposal. This is, um, this is the offer to sell something, to buy something, or exchange. As you know, many chambers publish business proposals from their chamber members on their websites, just like on bulletin boards. And now we, the idea is to unite all these bulletin boards from chamber websites to one chamber-based marketplace. And at the same time, uh, each chamber can use this marketplace and, and present as its own uh, as its own service, its, its own platform on its territory uh, in its region. Today, uh, the platform which was created one and a half years ago, uh, it unites more than 50 chambers around the world. It was presented on the World Chamber Congress this year. Uh, there are more than 100, 1,000 approved businesses which, are, which were approved manually, and they work on this platform right now. They published more than 5,000 business, current uh, business proposals, which were already checked by, uh, by their uh, chambers. And uh, there were six, more than 6,000 business connections on this platform. So we can, uh, we can say that it is an effective way to interact between chamber members from different, from different countries. The core of the entire system is the catalog of business proposals. It is divided into categories, goods for business, services, investment projects, experts, and many other, uh, many other catalog uh, parts. In other words, this is an online exhibition where everyone can tell what they do and what they can offer to others. Every, every business proposal page on the chamber-based platform uh, has its description, price, company info, reviews, documents verified by chambers, presentations, photos, and videos. And if you're interested in published, in published proposal or offer, you can apply or ask a question, which will be immediately sent to the company by email. Also, platform provides digital contracts. It is uh, very convenient, no need to send printed documents anymore. This service is based on digital signatures, uh, which are officially implemented in some countries. We also propose to discuss that chambers of CASI uh, can develop its own international digital signatures that will work internationally between members of different chambers. If the catalog of proposals doesn't contain what uh, you were looking for, you can publish request your own commercial tender. Describing your issue, you announce a competition among other participants of the platform and the winner who offered the best conditions becomes your supplier. Another way to use business market is inter, uh, industrial cooperation. Chambers can provide the exchange process of spare resources between companies. Any chamber member can say, I do not have my own resources to fulfill my contract. Then other companies can offer him to rent the, their resources, which were currently not involved Anyway, resources are production facilities, specialists, areas, equipment, transport, and so on. Such intercompany optimization helps to use resources very efficiently on a global scale. The business market has a lot of interesting features, but the most important is localization. As I told, uh, there, there are more than uh, 50, 50 chambers which uh, use business market right now, and their members use it. And uh, in every country, in every city, the business market is branded for the local chamber. So they use it at its own service. So we have a special proposal for CASI members. We want to, to join the platform members of every uh, chambers from CASI. It's absolutely for free to join. So we want, to, we want our m chamber members to interact to each other to publish their business proposals, business opportunities, and to trade more uh, without borders.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a platform for all the chambers to be part of, and it's easy, a plug-and-play platform? Yes, this uh, platform is for chamber members and their partners, so everyone can send requests to each, to, to its uh, chamber, its local chamber, and ask to publish the business proposal to this platform, and everyone around the world can see it uh, and uh, apply. Thank you for your informative um, presentation. I request Mr. At Attorney Bobby Fondevilla, Director, DTI BOI Investment Assistance Services, Department of Trade and Industry, Republic of Philippines, to make his remark. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation, um, I'd like to, I think that's okay. Okay, you can place it there. Yes, I would like to uh, make a short audiovisual presentation, a five-minute audiovisual presentation. First, before I proceed to my PowerPoint slides. Yeah, they have the PowerPoint presentation. Is gonna play. In the fast expanding geography of global business, get on the right track that leads to your investment goals. Invest in the Philippines, where core advantages navigate you to your investment success. Here is where your investment will be handled by the experienced hands of the Philippines Board of Investments. The BOI is the prime developer of Philippine industries and investments, functioning as an attached agency of the Department of Trade and Industry. It is the lead government agency in charge of developing and implementing policies, programs and projects that enable local industries and sectors to be more competitive. As the country's foremost promotions agency, the BOI promotes the most ideal business opportunities to both local and foreign investors. The BOI gets your investment going by way of a synergistic investment team that ensures seamless registration. That's all business, all about servicing investors. That's our best guarantee of your investment growth and assured protection. Only the Philippines BOI offer the Investment Priorities Plan, a focused strategic program aimed at directing you to industries and sectors that are prioritized as being the business opportunities where investors can fill the industry needs. Automotive assembly is one opportunity that's about to hit full speed ahead thanks to the BOI's comprehensive automotive resurgence strategy. Shipbuilding and repair is among the country's wave of emerging industries. The local aerospace industry is off to a flying start and in need of technology partners. If uh, more MROs open here, especially the big ones, that will bring in vendors and the vendors will be our suppliers and they will be next door. This becomes an aerospace hub already. The Board of Investment continues to support many strategic sectors in the economy. Aside from supporting our airline, the Board of Investment has supported our growth in airline-related entities, particularly in maintenance, repair, and operations. Investment opportunities are just bountiful in the Philippine agricultural sectors. The boundless wealth of fertile lands and seas offer year-round crops and fishery production, resulting in robust agri-processing industries as well as competitive supply chain exports. Mindanao has a lot of lands that are utilized and underutilized. And therefore, it is a very big opportunity for many investors 
to go into uh, even other crops, not just oil palm. It's now in full swing. The Philippines' unprecedented Build, Build, Build program is a massive infrastructure undertaking that opens tremendous opportunities for investor partnerships in building roads, bridges, airports and seaports, flood management, water resources, energy communications, waste management, among others. We believe that there is plenty of space to grow for industries such as heavy industries, construction, not just for the high end, but especially for the low end market. There is a housing shortage in the Philippines and that cannot be sustained or that cannot be met by the local players alone. We have an open economy market and that is easier for businesses to come in because we have less restrictions. We have uh, policies that attract investors to come in. Building opportunities for industries. Building opportunities for investors. Your advantage, our Philippines. Thank you very much. In 2018, the Philippines Board of Investment has uh, investment approvals amounting to 915 billion pesos, which is 48% higher than the one recorded in 2017, which is only 617 billion pesos. For 2019, the Philippines Board of Investment targeted 1 trillion investment approvals. And in the, neck, in the first 10 months of this year, we have already breached that 1 trillion pesos investment approval as we have recorded 1.040 investments approval at by end of 20, uh, 2019 October. This is the highest ever in the history of the agency's 52 years in, in existence. I would say that the Philippine economy is very resilient amid internal and external shocks. Why do I say so? The Philippines' performance in, from 2010 to 2018 says it all. We have an average growth of 6.3% with industry growing at an average rate of 6.9, services at 6.3, and agriculture at 1.7. This is, of course, supported by steady growth in exports, both in merchandise as well as export in services. We have also a very robust domestic financial sector, coupled, coupled with a very good credit growth. For 2018, loans of universal and commercial banks amounted to $171 billion. And its non-performing loans is only 1.4%. We always say that the Philippines is in a democratic sweet spot. Why do we say so? We have a population of 104 million Filipinos. The median age of the, of the Filipino population is 24.1. This is basically the average age of somebody who's just graduated from college. We have a very ra high rate of graduates every year. For 2017 to 2018 school year, we were able to produce 708,000 graduates from across a wide range of disciplines, from ar architecture, agriculture, education, engineering, IT services, mathematics, maritime, medicine and health related courses, sciences. Our daily wage rate is only 537 pesos, or roughly equivalent to 10 to 11 uh, US dollars a day. We have, uh, next slide, we have access to key markets from our neighbors, both in the Southeast Asian region, as well as, as in the East Asian, namely Japan, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea. The country's location is, an, is a very critical entry point to over 600 million people in the ASEAN market and a natural gateway to the East Asian economies. The country is likewise placed at the crossroads of international shipping and airlines. Within Asia alone, well, at least Southeast Asia and the East Asia, the Philippines is reachable within three to four hours by plane. In terms of market size, as I said, Philippines has a 104 million population, 
while ASEAN has 629 million. And ASEAN plus six is 3.5 billion population, one half of the world's population. And in terms of economy, this represents 22.4 trillion US dollars, one third of the world's economy. The Philippines likewise has access, has access to the EU as well as the US. For the EU, we have duty-free access for at least 6,274 tariff lines under the EU GSP Plus program. And we are the only ASEAN economy that is granted these privileges by the EU. For the US, 70% of Philippine exports enter the US duty-free under GSP and MFN. The present administration, likewise, is pushing for the Build, Build, Build program, amounting to at least 8.4 trillion pesos, or approximately 168 billion in total, for the entire six-year period of its administration. This includes projects in um, seaports, land transport terminals, airports, um, railroads, as well as bridges, as well as the creation of new cities. We offer competitive investment incentives. We, we have, maybe this is very common in other countries as well. We likewise offer um, income tax holiday, which means uh, exemption for payment of corporate income taxes for a period between six to four, four to six years and additional bonus years of a maximum of three years, depending on the meeting of certain conditions. We have also a special tax rate of 5% on gross income in case you have already used up your ITH for the importation of capital equipment, spare parts and supplies. If you are registered with the BOI, you enjoy zero duty. But if you are registered with our export economic zones, you can import this tax and duty free. Same is true for raw materials and supplies used for export. And of course, you also have incentives for value added tax as well as employment of foreign nationals. Next slide. Just to cite uh, the Philippines GSP status plus with the EU. This was approved in December 2014. It provides duty-free entry to the EU for some of the most important Philippine exports, including fruits and foodstuffs, coconut oil, footwear, fish, and textile. Because of this, the, PH, the Philippines now has a leverage for business with agricultural manufacturing facilities who wish to enter the EU market. The Philippines' total exports to the EU is expected to grow by 12%, creating additional work uh, or additional jobs of 267,000. This creates, therefore, a market opportunity for industrial investments in sectors with zero tariffs under GSP Plus of the EU. This includes established Filipino exports that are labor-intensive, uh, such as the ones mentioned before, uh, a while ago. Next slide, please. For other areas of investments, uh, we offer multiple indefinite visa for foreign nationals who will invest in the Philippines for as low as 75,000 US dollars. And this will remain indefinite for as long as his investment subsists in the Philippines. We have likewise liberalized our retail trade and we have allowed entry of foreign banks in the Philippines. Next. Since the Philippines does not allow ownership of private lands for foreigners, we have created the law, we have enacted the law that would grant a long-term lease of private lands for a period of 50 years, renewable for another 25 years. Next. One of the most important reforms that we have implemented just very recently is the enactment of the Ease of Doing Business Act enacted in 2018, just last, last year, <clears throat> which promotes transparency and simplified requirements and procedures to reduce red tape and expedite business and non-business rela related transactions in the government. Here in this law, all government institutions were required to submit to, anti, to the anti-red tape authority all their transactions, business related or non-business related, and they have to, to uh, classify it as simple, complex or highly technical. So all simple tra transactions should be finished or evaluated within three days. 
for complex transactions, this should be completed within seven days, and for highly technical, only for a period of 20 days. Likewise, the law required <clears throat> that for every document, only three signatories should appear therein, otherwise it's violation of the law. There is also a zero contact policy, this, which means that once an application is filed, there should be no more contact with, between the applicant and the office or the official in that particular office. Of course, except only in cases where certain clarifications have to be made. And the penalty that is prescribed in the law to strike policy. First violation would mean suspension for that government official for six months. Second offense would already mean dismissal from service with forfeiture of all retirement benefits. Despite this law, we in the BOI has further strengthened our as investment assistance and facilitation services. You know why? Despite the presence of this law. Because not the businessman would surely not simply file a case against uh, a certain government uh, office. For this office, they will continue to transact with for as long as their business is in our country. So ours is a soft approach. We have established a network of 37 government offices. We have asked them to appoint focal persons so that whenever um, investors or businessmen come to our office with certain problems and concerns, we will just contact the focal person in that particular office and we will be able to solve the problem without these businessmen going to the anti-red tape authority and file cases against them. We have, uh, we have so many more reforms that are take under, uh, taking place, but uh, these are in the form of uh, proposed laws. And uh, maybe in the near future, this will contribute further to the uh, contribution of, uh, in the promotion rather of ease of doing business in the Philippines. Just to cite an example, in 2018, uh, the World Bank ranking for the Philippines in the ease of doing business is 123. In the latest ranking that they released, the Philippines has jumped to number 95. And I can only say that part of it is because of our efforts to continue improving the ease of doing business in the Philippines. Why do we continue improving the ease of doing business in the Philippines? Because of this quotation. If you, if you don't delight your customers, your competitors will. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bobby Fondevilla, for your very informative uh, presentation. At this moment, I would request uh, Mr. Brian O'Gallagher, Deputy CEO, Australia Chamber of Commerce, Northern Territory, to make his uh, remark, please. Welcome. Sorry, can everyone hear me at the back? Great. Fantastic. Um, if we can just get the presentation up, that'd be fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, look, on behalf of the uh, Northern Territory Chamber of Commerce, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's fantastic to, uh, this is my first time to Bangladesh, and uh, I certainly congratulate uh, Sheikh Hakim and FBCCI, and also our very good friend uh, Samir Modi from CASI, for hosting this event. And can I also acknowledge the uh, wonderful speech we had from our special guest, uh, Mr. Raman, uh, just prior to morning too. I thought that was an excellent speech, sir. And you certainly talked about collaboration. You talked about sharing knowledge. And I'm hopeful that uh, in my presentation, I'm able to take up some of those uh, elements. Um, when I was asked to speak today, uh, Cassie wanted to uh, bring some case examples of practical examples of how we have sort of uh, engaged in the region, doing some practical things for our businesses and also engage with the wider region. So you'll see up on the slide there, one thing I want to talk about is our Southeast Asian Vocational Education and Training Project, which has been very successful and it's a great way of uh, building relationships and building industry across the region, particularly our tourism industry. 
The second project I want to talk about is an initiative that we commenced back in 2016, which is the Regional Australia Asia Chambers Forum. And I was very pleased that uh, Mr Modi was able to come to the second one in Darwin in May this year. And I'm also announcing, and I'm very conscious of Attorney uh, Bobby there, he may not know, but the uh, Governor of Negros Occidental, uh, the province in the Philippines, has agreed to host that forum in Bacolod, the capital city of his province, next November. And we certainly encourage everyone here to save that date. So very quickly, as I said, I'm from the Northern Territory of Australia. Many of you may not know where that is, and I'll certainly go through that. I want to talk about the tourism and hospitality demands of our Southeast Asian region and the greater region. I want to talk about a win-win solution that helps address some of the key issues there, particularly the provision of human capital and skills. Uh, I'll go through some of that and then I'll just once again just touch on the regional chambers forum. So you can see from the slide there's the Northern Territory of Australia. It's that middle bit uh, going north. It's uh, very close to Indonesia. To go to Bali takes about two, just over two or under two and a half hours. We're also only about a four hour flight to Singapore. If we're in Darwin, our capital city, it takes four hours to fly to Sydney. So we're just as close to Singapore as we are to Singapore. Interesting though, and you see that last figure, we only have a population of 250,000 people. Now Bangladesh has 163, 165 million people. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, if you know about Australia, most of the population is down on the east coast and down in the south. The northern part of Australia is the underdeveloped part of Australia. But that's where the new potential is. And that northern part of Australia is the closest part to Asia. And of course, if you go north, you get into that dynamic Asian region with uh, probably the fastest growing population in the world, one of the most sizable populations. If you go south, you probably run into about 50, 100 million penguins down in um, Antarctica. And to the side, you might run into a couple of million kiwis, but we won't talk about them just yet. As I said, there are more people living in that circle just north of the Northern Territory than elsewhere in the world. That is the growth engine of the world. And I think uh, Samir Modi talked about uh, letting Asia roar. Well, this shows you where Asia can roar. So when I talked about the Northern Territory, in terms of land mass, it's 18% of the Australian continent. As you see there, it's uh, be about one-sixth the size of China. So this is just one province or one state. It's three and a half times the size of Japan, and we do have major relationships with Japan in terms of the provision of energy. It's almost half the size of India, and I did a rough calculation, and it's about nine times the size of Bangladesh. Having said that, we only have 250,000 people. So if you look at density, and I sort of did the uh, number of square kilometres times the divided by the population, whatever. I think Bangladesh would have about approximately 2,900 people per square kilometre. It's very dense. In the Northern Territory, you would have one person per 5.6 kilometres. So uh, huge differentials in terms of... Uh, uh, demographics and so on. But the Northern Territory is resource rich. We currently supply over 10% of the natural gas to Japan. We now have onshore gas developments coming forward and more offshore gas developments, 
uh, potentially that could grow to 30% of Japan's LNG imports uh, over the next 10 years. We also have major um, mining uh, uh, resource industry. So we've certainly got uh, world-class lead zinc mines. We certainly have gold mines. We have a whole range of uh, uh, lumina. We're very resource rich. We have a growing agricultural industry. Uh, we are the largest live cattle exporters uh, out of Australia. Now that predominantly goes to Indonesia and to Vietnam. But you can understand we have a lot of land and we are developing new agricultural industries, including potentially cotton. And I've just been talking to a couple of cotton importers from here. And just on that note, I'd just like to say that when you talk, come to these conferences, it's really good to have speeches and so on. But the main thing is the business to business dealings. So you need to get around and talk to other people because you never know what those opportunities are. Now I've got two of my colleagues here and I'd like to introduce them. One is Mr. Sean Marnie, he'll be speaking tomorrow. Sean is the chair of our International Business Council, but he also operates his own hospitality college. And I know he's already had some Bangladeshi students come to that college and he's obviously looking for more. And I'll explain that later why. But Sean, if you could stand up. Sean is also a qualified migration agent. And the Northern Territory has a very innovative uh, migration plan that is targeting strategic investors to come and invest in the Territory. It is the best plan in Australia, but it only applies to the Northern Territory. The thresholds for investment are much lower than Sydney or Melbourne. And it also, if you meet all the Australian government requirements and the necessary conditions, it actually gives you a fast track way to get permanent residency in Australia. So if anyone wants to talk about those opportunities, please see Sean later today or tomorrow. The other person I'd like to introduce is Mr. Ravi. Mr. Ravi is actually based in Switzerland, but the company Oceanic Multi Trading is a long-term member of the Northern Territory Chamber of Commerce. They actually grow cattle and export cattle, but it is a multi-trading company, and I know they are looking not only to export more products to Bangladesh, but they are looking to invest in Bangladesh. And I believe you're already looking to invest in uh, palm oil processing. Is that correct, Ravi? So it's not, it's got to be two way and investment. And I think that's where these conferences are a great way to bring people together. So the industry that I've found across the whole region that every nation seems to want to develop, including Australia, is the tourism industry. And one of the reason, reasons we want to develop the tourism industry is probably because it uh, generates a lot of local employment and it's great industry. And when you look around um, the, the region, everyone is investing in brand new hotels, they're doing resorts and all that. The challenge they all have is where do they get the qualified staff to man this? Because by default, a lot of it, the tourists they are trying to attract are Western tourists. You need to give a great experience. And that experience is by service and staff and people. You can go anywhere and find a resort with nice rooms and uh, food, uh, you know, pools and all that. But the competitive edge is how do you get trained staff? And that's part of what we're trying to solve here. In the Northern Territory, we also have a, a lot of tourists. While we only have 250,000 people, we get 2 million tourists per year. So it's a major industry for us. It's a major employer. Our challenge is we don't have enough people to service it. So is there a way of leveraging off other nations like Bangladesh or Indonesia or Vietnam who have a lot of people 
who could train, but they could also help us service our local industry as part of their training. Let's take that on a bit. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Now, if you look at Indonesia, as I said, the Northern Territory is only uh, just over two hours away from Bali. The Indonesian president has a strategic plan to develop another 10 Balis, and that's a good plan. That's great economic development for his country. But Indonesia is going to face that same challenge of do we have the skilled staff? Vietnam, we've been to Vietnam a number of times. You drive down the coast, you fly into Nha Trang, you drive into the CBD area. There are about 15 brand new resorts being built, but they don't have the qualified staff and they need about 30 or 40,000 people. So how do we bring that together? Well, we need hospitality workers. We actually have qualified, internationally qualified training uh, schools, including one operated by Mr. Marnie. When they come to do a one year or two year training course in, let's say, Darwin Northern Territory, whether they come from Vietnam, whether they come from Indonesia, whether they come from the Philippines, whether they come from Bangladesh, as long as they meet all the criteria, those students, and yes, they have to pay, it's a, this isn't a uh, subsidy, this is a private sector business, but those students as part of their training can work because they get practical industry development uh, with our businesses. Being available to work helps us overcome, for our employers, some of those labour shortfalls that they can't get because we don't have enough people. If they work in Darwin, our capital city, just as part of their training, even just doing coffee or waitressing or whatever, they will get paid the most of anywhere on the planet. They'll get more than they will in London. They'll get more than they will in uh, Sydney more than they will in New York, definitely more than they'll get in Jakarta or Manila or um, Ho Chi Minh City. So at the entry level, as part, and as part of their visa, depending on what course they take, they can work up to 45 hours per week. That's part of their training. And they will be paid somewhere between 23 to 30 Australian dollars per hour, which is probably around the 18 US to... Um, I'm only guessing here, about 25 US, somewhere around that range. That's a good hourly rate. And if you look at the maths, if they're successful and do that, the money they earn can pay back their tuition fees, can pay back all their health and living costs in Australia, and they probably still have money to send back to mum and dad as well. And that's a good thing. So what do they get in return? They come to Australia, they get uh, accredited training, uh, Australian qualifications that they can take back to their own country. They actually get 12 or two years practical experience of working in a Western environment, which makes them very attractive for their hotels and so on back in their own countries to employ, as well as their also working, uh, helping us uh, fill our shortfall in workers because our local hotels love having the students working for them. And then they go back and they've got uh, Western accreditations and they are highly valuable back for their own tourism industry. So here's an example and there's uh, my good friend, Mr. Marnie, uh, the students up in Ho Chi Minh and they have a fantastic time. And these are students coming from all around the world. They have an enjoyable time, but they learn a really important trade and skill. Uh, we also, as a chamber, we will connect the students up with local employers so that they can easily find a job when they come to study. That's a practical thing that chambers of commerce can do. Collaboration is the key. Uh, we've certainly uh, signed agreements with uh, Vietnam. Uh, we had an MOU signed by the Deputy Prime Minister there. We certainly work with our 
fellow chambers in um, Vietnam, in Indonesia, in the Philippines and so on. And one other thing, and this also comes back to the uh, province of Negros Occidental in the Philippines, is that province and their government, because they need to train their students up, have developed an innovative financing plan for their students to come down and study. It's basically a low-cost loan provided by the government to their student, but the students pay the government back. And I'm sure Sean can elaborate on that uh, either one-on-one -on -one or tomorrow if you come to his presentation. So there are creative ways of making things happen because we all want to grow our tourism industry. We all want to get people employed and this is one practical measure of how we can do it. The Regional Australia Asia Chambers Forum, as I said, this is the, uh, we held the second one back in uh, May. We held the first one back in uh, April 2016. Our original plan was, uh, the second one was going to be held in Malaysia but there was a, uh, an election and uh, the election confused everyone in some ways so we had to sort of hold it again. But I'm very pleased to say that the uh, Philippine province of Negros Occidental is uh, keen to host the next one, and they have selected 26 to 27 November 2020. It, again, is about connecting people in the region. Uh, when we've had people there, we've had about uh, representatives from about 13 countries from across the region, and once again, we focus very much on business-to-business -business matchmaking because I think that's the key part of what we can help people with. Uh, that bottom slide on the uh, left, that's the former governor of Negros Occidental, and he was very uh, keen on this program. And of course, Samir Modi, he was our um, uh, guest speaker at our one in May this year. But importantly, Samir, like I would encourage everyone else here, he's gone out and bought local products, souvenirs, crocodile whips, hats. I would encourage everyone here to think about looking around Bangladesh and take something back for your family or your spouse, buy local, and that's the way you actually contribute to the economy. So I'd certainly encourage everyone to do that. Uh, finally, thank you very much and uh, all the best. Thank you, Mr. Brian O'Gallagher. Uh, we believe that we can have lots of, we have lots of opportunities to collaborate on hospitality mod modules that uh, Mr. Sean has to offer. And uh, later on, we'll talk to you about how cooperation can be uh, explored and executed uh, with uh, our members and also with FBCCI. At this point, I would request Mr. Ihan Zeti Noglu. Vice President yes. Tobe, I recall my visit with uh, Mr. Rifat Beg, such a wonderful person, last time when I was in uh, Antalya, yes. a beautiful city Thank by the, the Turkish Riviera. And uh, we, it is a pleasure to have you amongst us from Tobe. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am Vice President of Union of Chambers of Commodity Exchanges of Turkey. I'm also the president of Kojeli Chamber of Industry with the trade volume of industrial trade volume of $70 billion. First of all, I would like to greet you on behalf of Union of Chambers of Commodity Exchanges of Turkey. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be among the distinguished speakers in this session. Today, I would like to give you a brief information about the economy and business environment of Turkey. Turkey is in the junction point of the three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. <clears throat> Within the duration of four hours flight, it is possible to reach to 1.5 billion people with the economic size of $24 trillion and $8 trillion of foreign trade. We change from a country depending on agricultural products to a country exporting industrial products. 
Turkey has reached the rate of urbanization in 50 years. Well, it needed 100 years for Germany to get urbanized. Thanks to custom union, the EU has become our largest export market with 51%. You can see some of the basic criteria of Turkey's position in the world economy. I would like to give some information on the business environment of Turkey. 94% of our exports are industrial products. 60% of these exports is to Europe and USA, which are the most competitive markets. 41% of, of the goods we export are consumer goods. So we are exporting finished goods. We are an attractive investment center for the global capital also. Turkey has received 150 billion global investment over the last 10 years. 80% of the FDI is from Europe and the United States. Only last year, FDI inflow was $12 billion. On the other hand, as Turkey, we have a large number of trade agreements in order to benefit from the global trade. We are in custom union with EU. We can sell industrial goods to Europe duty-free. We also have FDAs with many countries. Regarding agriculture, we are the seventh largest, largest producer country in the world. We have 150 billion of agricultural production. We export 1,781 1, kinds of agri agricultural products to 190 countries. The export volume of agricultural products has reached to $17 billion. Turkey is the 15th largest manufacturer in the world and fifth largest in Europe. Turkey is the largest manufacturer of light commercial vehicles in Europe. Global automotive companies made $12 billion investment in Turkey between the years 2000 and 2018. Currently, 13 different auto companies are operating in Turkey. Their production has reached from 300,000 in 2000 to 1.4 million in 2018. We are the largest auto supplier in, in Europe. 75% of our production in Turkey is being exported to Germany, France, Italy, England, and Spain. Turkey has an important place in terms of chemical industry. Turkey produces 3% of world's plastic production. Turkey is the seventh largest plastic manufacturer in the world and the fifth largest paint manufacturer in Europe. World's second largest petrochemical importer after China. According to the list of the world's top 250 international contractors, Turkey is in the second place for the number of contracting companies building major pro projects across the world. Currently, total of 46 Turkish companies took place in the list. In the first nine months of 2019, Turkish contracting companies undertook a total of 151 projects worth 7.5 billion abroad. Turkey's annual export of construction materials reached to $20 billion. Defense is one of the rising industry of Turkey. We can see this from the both export level, export level and Turkey's dependency on imports. When we compare the figures of 2008 and 2018, we can see that Turkey has increased its imports almost three times exports from 
0.6 billion US dollars to 1.7 billion dollars. Turkey at the same time has de decreased its dependency to the import of defense industrial products. Our situation in other industrial sectors is as follows. We are the second biggest supplier of textile and apparel in Europe. Third in Europe in the production of chemical products. products. We are second in Europe in steel production. In the construction sector, 46 in the world's largest 250 companies. We are second in the sector after China. Our machinery industry is highly developed. In 2018, machinery exports rose from 14 billion. It was 6 billion 10 years ago. We export machinery to more than 200 countries. 60% of exports go to Europe and the United States, which indicates the quality of the production. We are among the 10 most preferred countries in the world in tourism. Last year, 40 million foreign tourists visited Turkey and 50 million is targeted next year. Turkey has become number sixth in terms of world's most visited destinations. Istanbul is among the 10 most visited cities in the world. 10 million foreign tourists visited Istanbul last year. Istanbul is among the 10 most preferred global congress centers in the world also. I would like to thank once again for this opportunity and thank you for your attention. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ahan. I believe Bangladesh and other countries uh, within the Kasi can learn from the transition of agricultural economy to the manufacturing from Turkey, as well as the hospitality industry that is very thriving. And those of us who have traveled through the Eurasian region, everybody knows how beautiful the city of Istanbul is. At this moment, I would kindly request our uh, chief guest and chief panelist, Mr. Salman F. Rahman, to share his remark on the opportunities of enterprise within the Kasi region. Mr. Salman F. Rahman. Thank you. Actually, uh, <clears throat> Actually, I think today, uh, what I had said in my opening remarks that the CASI has a fantastic uh, opportunity and it is a very, very unique platform for bringing people together. So what was fascinating actually was the uh, uh, country presentations which we uh, saw today. And it was really the one we saw from Philippines, the one we saw from Northern Territories, from Turkey and uh, Russian uh, experience on getting, putting everybody together. What was really fascinating was the contrast that uh, here you, in, in one platform, you have the Northern Territories, which is only 250,000 people. And we have Bangladesh, which is 160 million people. So uh, it, the contrast is huge. But then if you compare the land, uh, it's again, so these, uh, it's really, it's, uh, I, I think the big opportunity. And I think I was very uh, interested by the, uh, from the Moscow uh, chamber, the, uh, the business uh, model, which they have uh, said that is already there. It's uh, operational. And I think that is something because in today's digital world, online uh, conferences like this, of course, help for uh, there's nothing replaces people-to-people uh, -people contact, but I think online having the B2B opportunity of doing the businesses and that platform is already there. So I think so a lot of it is happening. So what I thought is that actually uh, this is, uh, again, I would like to really congratulate uh, both Kasi and FBCCI for organizing this and for getting all of us together and the opportunities I think are immense. And uh, the hospitality industry, this is something which I think is huge for everybody, uh, all the countries. And tourism is such that it, every country has something to offer for, for uh, tourism. 
So, you know, it's something which is, uh, is it's a common grain across uh, all societies and if that can be developed. So, I, I really am uh, very, very uh, happy that this is, uh, that you all, and actually in this panel you have given opportunity to only four countries and uh, five countries to give their country presentations. But if you had given opportunity to all the 27 country, member countries of CASI to give presentations on each country, you would find the diversity, the contrast, the opportunity, it would be huge. It would be much uh, more already only with these uh, small, uh, with these uh, brief uh, presentations which we have seen already. You can see how much opportunity there is for cooperation and for uh, people working together. So I think uh, I will just uh, uh, again repeat uh, what I said in the morning that uh, you should expand on this. And Kasi is a unique platform, and actually. Uh, the leadership of Kasi, I would urge them to uh, really uh, take full uh, to take full advantage of the uh, opportunity which this platform presents. So I think with these words, uh, my remarks for the moment, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Advisor. Uh, and you have rightly said that these are because of the time shortage. We had only the. Uh, uh, possible to have four of our colleagues here, but within the networking session, we believe that the other members that are present, other delegates, they will share their experience. And their delegates from Bangladesh as well, who would be happy to learn about the opportunities and modalities of cooperation. With this note, uh, I would thank all the panelists and uh, we would bring this session to a close. I would request the uh, panelists plaques and the chief guest flags to be brought up to the stage. Um, thank you very much, all the panelists, distinguished panelists, for being here and sharing your experience. We look forward to being engaged, and uh, hopefully we will draw up a, a roadmap to cooperate in the days to come. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A big thank you to all our country presenters for their interesting and informative presentations. To show our gratitude to the country presenters, we would now like to request uh, the session chairman, Mr. Sheikh Fazle Fahim, to present the certificate of appreciation to all the country presenters. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of FBCCI will be presenting the crest of appreciation to Mr. Salman Fazlu Rahman MP. Next, the session chair will present the crest of appreciation to Mr. Artem Delovich. Next, the uh, session chair will present the crest of appreciation to Mr. Bobby Von Villa. Crest is uh, presented to Mr. Ihan Zaytuklu. Hmm? 
The chief panelist is presenting the token of appreciation to Mr. Bobby Fawn Villa. Brian Last but not the least, the chief panelist is presenting the token of the session chair is presenting the token of appreciation to Mr. Brian Gallagher. And the certification of appreciation from Kasi is being presented to the speaker. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes the session of Discover Business Opportunities through Kasi. We'd now like to invite everyone for lunch. The lunch venue is in the ballroom next adjacent to this hall. Only the registered participants will be invited for the lunch. We wish to remind all the delegates that plenary session one will begin at 1.45 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to remind all the delegates that plenary session one will begin at 1.45 p.m. <laughs>